So thanks for having me here. Um, I want to tell you something about uh, the construction of our core collection in the Strawberry Breeding Program. Um, I'm doing a project uh, in collaboration with the Wageningen University and Fresh Forward. And for me, the first question, and for you probably as well, is why do we want to develop a core collection in Strawberry? Um, well, there are several, uh, several ways and several goals uh, for a core collection, but our main goal is that we want to develop a high throughput uh, sequencing uh, pipeline. And there's a method that's already widely adopted in uh, human studies uh, that, used, uh, that uses reduced information genotypes together with a high quality reference haplotype panel in order to impute the uh, reduced information genotypes. Um, so it goes like this in the uh, A, in the top right corner, you have some study samples in the top. And if you compare them to uh, your library of haplotypes, uh, you can find the best matching haplotypes. And in the end, you can impute them. Sounds very simple, it's not very simple. Um, but that's why we want to, uh, to make a core collection. Um, there are uh, two main uh, things that uh, influence the quality of a core collection. Um, the, first, the first is the size of the panel. So the more often you see a haplotype, the more certain you are that the haplotype is real and that's present in your panel. Um, but the second one uh, is, I think, more important, or at least um, we can influence that one more than the first one because the size of the panel is just a matter of how, many, how much resource you have available. So just a matter of money. Um, and the second one, genetic similarity, is something you can uh, really investigate. So that's where we will focus on. Um, so core collections are already widely used and adopted uh, by gene banks. Uh, so there are, are already a lot of methods in place developed by uh, gene banks, which we can use. But there are also some obvious differences between gene banks and uh, plant breeding programs. Uh, one of the main differences is that uh, plant breeding programs evolve over time. So the genetic variation present in a plant breeding program right now is different than the genetic variation uh, of next year and of the year after that and the year after that, etc. So one of the important things to make the core collection future proof is to uh, yeah, kind of predict the future um, because we already have the future present in the breeding program uh, in uh, selections that are in various stage stages, but also in uh, specific genotypes that are selected for specific traits, for example, uh, resistances uh, or the nice, uh, nice traits. Um, so that's why we decided to have a first a step one in our uh, core collection selection to uh, select these must have uh, genotypes. Uh, we selected the most frequently used uh, recent crossing parents because they represent uh, future variation the best. Uh, and we selected some specific genotypes, uh, which according to the, the breeder are going to become uh, important or have important genetic variation for the future. Um, then the second part is the selection of the current variation that's currently present in the breeding program. Uh, so this year, uh, and that's very similar that uh, gene banks are doing. Um, and there are a few uh, different core collection types, and uh, I have here uh, two main types, but there are more. Um, but these types uh, are, I think, the most useful for us, at least. Uh, the first type is uh, on the left picture, uh, a type one uh, core collection, which has several different names and are defined by Odong et al. Oh, sorry, uh, a paper in uh, of 2013. Um, and the first type is the most, uh, selects the most representative uh, individuals. And the second type uh, selects the most, uh, the maximum range of variation. And in our case, we are interested in the most representative uh, core collection because in that sense, uh, we minimize the, or we maximize the genetic similarity between the potential study samples and our uh, reference haplotype panel in that sense. Um, and something very important is that uh, these core collections are uh, developed and made based on uh, genotype relationships. Um, so that's something to take in mind. Um, so in order to, um, to complement our first our manual selection with the current genetic variation, uh, we used a nice R package, core hunter tree, uh, which uh, implemented already uh, the different types of uh, 
calculates that you can uh, develop of odometal, <coughs> so the type one, the type two, and some other types. Um, and we complemented our uh, manual selection with uh, the most representative uh, individuals. Um, well, as input using uh, what we already have sequenced. So we already have uh, a few genotypes that are sequenced or uh, present uh, in the core collection or ready for the reference panel, but also part of uh, the manual selection. We can put it in uh, to the uh, core hunter package and we can uh, ask core hunter to select the most, uh, the, the, the best genotypes that complement the core collection the most in order to reach the type one core collection goal. Um, and something that uh, um, made me realize that this actually yeah, works and does a good job is that we have in red uh, a Mediterranean part of the breeding program, which has a small narrow basis in this uh, PCA plot. And uh, in general, there are more individuals, but in the core collection, it selects uh, fewer individuals. Um, so that was the final core collection, but we used uh, this uh, core collection or this, uh, yeah, this core <laughs> into three package uh, with a relationship matrix. And that's something I think is very important in a breeding program um, because there are several ways to, uh, to estimate these relationships. And um, one of the ways is to do it based on the pedigree. Uh, because pedigree is available for all genotypes in a relationship uh, in, in a plant breeding program. Um, but a disadvantage is that the accuracy varies. Sometimes you have missing links. And there's also some uh, relationship between founders that are hard to estimate just based on the pedigree. You just don't know. And these can be solved by genomic based relationships. Uh, if you have uh, genotypes, you can calculate these relationships, but uh, and these are more accurate. Uh, but the main disadvantage is this is expensive because money and you're not going to genotype every uh, single individual in your uh, program. So uh, we wanted to combine the best of both worlds. Um, there's a method developed by uh, Nagara et al, where you can make a hybrid uh, pedigree genomic based uh, relationship matrix where you use uh, your uh, pedigree matrix to kind of extrapolate your uh, genotypic relationships over the pedigree. Um, and in this way, you can overcome the issues uh, of the pedigree-based relationships, or some of them at least. Um, and to illustrate that, uh, I met some heat maps. So on the left, you see a heat map just of the pedigree-based relationships. And uh, as you can see, if you compare it to the, the hybrid, the pedigree uh, genomic-based relationship matrix, uh, there's a lot more contrast as something that uh, stands out to me and is very important is that in the top right corner there's a block of uh, Mediterranean varieties and we know uh, because of the genotypic relationships that they should be uh, related towards uh, to, the, uh, to some effort bearing genotypes and uh, these individuals in this heat map don't have any genotypic information at all uh, but on the uh, on the right side in the hybrid pedigree genomic based relationship uh, matrix we use the genotypes uh, or the genotypic relationships of related individuals to extra uh, extrapolate this uh, with the method of the GARA uh, over the pedigree based matrix. And uh, in the end, we can see that the uh, relatedness between the effort bearing varieties and the uh, Mediterranean varieties is indeed there uh, as expected. So this shows that it's uh, quite a powerful method to. Uh, to calculate these. Um, so in summary, uh, at least for this part, because afterwards I want to show some uh, allopolyploid problems still, um, but for the core collection part is you have to um, be careful to not just select the current genetic variation, but uh, uh, also select <coughs> your future genetic variation as present in your advanced selections and specific genotypes. Uh, and then you should complement it with your current genetic variation with the tools that are uh, already available uh, by, uh, because of uh, gene bank research. Um, and you should use pedigree and genomic information to use the best of both worlds. Um, so one of the things we found is that you can uh, identify outliers by comparing these matrices and also that you don't need a lot of slips. Um, 
to reliable estimate the genomic relationships. Um, and now I want to show you some challenges we find because uh, after we select the core collection of all these genotypes, uh, we want to uh, to get the haplotypes of these uh, these individuals. Um, and that's a hard task. And uh, we found some uh, some interesting things that I just want to uh, to show you. Um, for haplotyping in general, it's important to have accurate SNP calls. So uh, you better remove unreliable SNPs than keep them, but you want uh, to keep a certain amount of, uh, of SNPs to uh, still have enough contrast. Uh, there are already several tools available also for diploids, but also for polyploids. We'll see later on, uh, but they all need accurate SNP calls. And as we uh, expect in another polyploid like strawberry, <laughs> Um, that most SNPs behave diploid, uh, look like diploid SNPs, uh, so that makes life a lot easier for us. But there are also uh, some SNPs that uh, look different, that have uh, some kind of background signal, and uh, yeah, they, they can be uh, octoploid, so that you only see one or two uh, alternative alleles compared to six or seven reference alleles, and these are very hard to accurately estimate or actually uh, accurately call when we only have uh, a depth of 20 or 25 X. Um, so in order to just get an estimation uh, or a measure how many uh, diploid SNPs we have in strawberry, I calculate the average of, uh, uh, of the ratio of expected heterozygous SNPs. Um, so I excluded the homozygous ones. And we should expect a uh, Gaussian distribution about 0 0.5. As you can see, uh, most regions are like this. So I have a distribution nicely uh, uh, around 0 0.5. It's also a bit more to the, to the right, uh, which are more, uh, more polyploid SNPs. But there are also regions like this where it's completely different. And the other question is, do we have, still have enough diploid SNPs to accurately call uh, the haplotypes or not? Um, I see my time is almost over. Uh, I think this is the last slide that I can show you. This is over a whole chromosome, just uh, a measure how many diploid-like SNPs, according to my uh, filters, are present over the genome in windows of uh, 50 KB. And what we see here that most regions have enough uh, diploid SNPs. Uh, so we shouldn't have uh, all problems there. But there are also regions like uh, the start of chromosome 1A, also some regions here uh, where it looks like there are not many diploid SNPs. So um, <coughs> yeah, how to deal with that is uh, one of the main questions I will uh, try to solve coming here. Uh, if you have any uh, recommendation, want to talk more about this, uh, I'm available today and tomorrow. Um, so uh, yeah, these are just some conclusions. So the depth of uh, 20 or 25x is probably not enough to a reliable estimation. To have a reliable estimation of the diploid SNPs, uh, what's the best way to estimate whether SNP is diploid and whether SNP is reliable? Uh, now many SNPs are still uh, are good enough or are enough to get reliable haplotypes. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention. <laughs>